They are everywhere in our environment. In the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat. They are in everyday products we use for personal care and cleaning. They are in our furniture, our children's toys, and the products we use in gardening and agriculture. And almost all of us have them inside our bodies. One day, our ancestor, Homo erectus, discovered fire. Huh? Well, what do you know? Fire? Hmm. Ingeniously, he used it for light. <sighs> for heat. Mm. <sighs> and for barbecue chicken. Yum. The news spread quickly. Soon we were baking clay, smelting ore. Humankind had fearlessly embarked on the road to progress. Today, thanks to human ingenuity, over 100,000 new chemicals synthesized in laboratories fashion the world we live in. We've introduced these amazing molecules into our environment without really considering whether nature would be able to recognize them and break them down. In our short-sighted rush to progress, we never imagined that some of these molecules would one day work their way into living organisms. No thought was really given to the health effects, maybe even outside uh, acute effects on workers. I mean, if something was killing someone in a factory, you might slow down the production of it. But once it was out into the environment, there were no laws, there were no regulations, there were no thresholds, and that is largely true today. I mean, one of our toughest talking points, both with reporters and with regular people, they just can't believe these chemicals aren't regulated, but they're not. A lot of these chemicals are post-war creations, so they, they entered commerce uh, you know, in the aftermath of World War II uh, at a time when safety testing requirements just didn't really exist. So these chemicals have been in, uh, in, in consumer products for decades and a lot of them are hormone disrupting chemicals. Uh, they, once they're in our bodies they mimic estrogen or testosterone and they trigger all of the uh, biological processes that, uh, that hormones trigger. We have found over 200 toxic chemicals in the umbilical cord blood of babies. So you're polluted before you're born. Some of those chemicals were banned 30 years ago and they're still showing up in newborns today. So we have this incredibly disturbing legacy of pollutants that stick around for a long time. They're toxic, they get into our blood. And on top of that, we have a flood of new chemicals and uses of those chemicals in consumer products day in and day out that we're exposed to. All around us are the products of modern chemistry. All are made of or covered with something that came out of a test tube. For instance, if you wanted to go to a chemist and say, look, I want to have a chemical, say a pesticide, which will persist throughout the food chain, and I don't want it to have to renew it uh, very, very often. I'd like it to be relatively non-destructible. And then he'd put two benzene molecules on the blackboard and add a chlorine here and a chlorine that. And th that was DDT. When the 8th Army needed Jap civilians to help them out in our occupation, they called on native doctors to administer DDT under the supervision of our men to stem a potential typhus epidemic. Dusting like this goes a long way in checking disease, <laughs> and the labs are them. Pardon our dust. As the petrochemical era grew and grew, warning signs emerged that some of these chemicals could pose hazards. The data initially were trivial, anecdotal, but gradually a body of data started accumulating to the extent that we now know that the synthetic chemicals which have permeated 
our workplace, our consumer products, our air, our water, produce cancer and also birth defects and some other toxic effects. Furthermore, industry has known about this, at least most industries have known about this, and have attempted to trivialize these risks. We are now in the midst of a major cancer epidemic, and I have no doubt, and I have documented the basis for this, that industry is largely responsible for this overwhelming epidemic of cancer in which one in every two men get cancer in their lifetimes and one in every three women get cancer in their lifetimes. All around us are the products of modern chemistry. Window shades, draperies, upholstery, and furniture. All are made of or covered with something that came out of a test tube. Radio cabinets, tabletops, and hundreds of other useful articles are made of new plastics created in the chemist's laboratory. Chemicals are part of our daily lives. They are everywhere in our personal care products, cosmetics, toys, cars, furniture, food packages, IT equipment, electrical appliance, everywhere. Consumers strongly believe that chemicals that are on the market have been tested and are safe. But this is far from being true. And a huge majority of chemicals that are on the market have never undergone any risk assessment. Some of them may cause allergies or cancer or obesity or disrupt your hormonal system. Now this is a problem for all consumers. But this is especially a problem for elderly people, for young children, for babies and for pregnant women. And studies have shown that there are already hundreds of chemicals in the blood of newborn babies. We have particular concerns with endocrine disruptors. Those are chemicals that disrupt your hormonal system and can lead to problems of fertility, to cancers, early puberty and obesity. Now those substances can be really harmful and they can have long-term effects even at a low dose. Our modern environment now includes over 80,000 synthetic chemicals with around a thousand new ones being created every year. More than 500 of these are known to cause cancer or to disrupt the hormones in the body. Of the substances that are strongly linked to breast cancer, many are chemically similar to oestrogen. Oestrogen is a natural hormone that promotes female characteristics and our cells recognize it by its phenyl ring. However, many synthetic chemicals also hold these phenyl rings. This can cause them to have oestrogen mimicking effects. These oestrogen mimics can cause problems by taking the place of natural oestrogen and turning effects on or off in the cells at the wrong times. Because of this hormone disrupting effect, the oestrogen mimics are classed as endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs. Importantly, these chemicals aren't only found in factories or behind laboratory doors, as they are all around us in our environment and everyday products. You can find EDCs in many toiletries, detergents, plastic containers and many other sources. Endocrine disruptors are chemicals of growing concern. Fetuses and children exposed to even minute amounts may develop a wide range of health conditions from diminished intelligence to cancers later in life. Our endocrine glands produce hormones that regulate the basic processes of our body, like metabolism, growth, reproduction, and development. Endocrine disruptors disturb how these processes work. 980 endocrine disrupting chemicals have now been identified. Among the most ubiquitous are a class of compounds called phthalates, bisphenol A, and flame retardants, including PBDEs, chemicals so common that almost all of us have them inside our bodies. 
Phthalates are in many common products, including food packaging, building materials, and pharmaceuticals. They're in our cars, and even in new car smell. They're used in cosmetics to hold fragrance and help products to more effectively penetrate and moisturize the skin. Phthalates may also be feminizing boys. Scientists found that phthalates may be associated with a shorter anogenital distance, the distance between the genitals and anus, a subtle marker of feminization in boys. The American Chemistry Council, which represents chemical manufacturers, says phthalates are among the most thoroughly studied compounds in the world and have a history of safe use. But phthalates are banned from children's toys in more than 10 countries and the European Union. In the United States, three phthalates were permanently banned from children's toys and child care articles in 2008 because of their potential to leach from plastic that's chewed or sucked. Bisphenol A is undoubtedly one of the most ubiquitous compounds in our lives. An additive in plastics and consumer products, BPA, makes up polycarbonate, a material as clear as water, as strong as steel, and a part of almost every plastic product we touch, eat, and drink from. It's one of the top industrial chemicals in the world. About six billion pounds of BPA are produced globally each year and about a hundred tons released into the atmosphere. BPA is of concern because it looks like an estrogen. Most people come into contact with BPA on a daily basis. It mimics the behavior of estrogens like estradiol to bind the estrogen receptors. This causes deviation from the normal behavior of the endocrine system, making BPA a powerful endocrine disruptor. The effects of BPA on the developing embryo can be permanent and dramatic. In addition to breast cancer, BPA may be associated with genetic damage and a wide variety of reproductive, metabolic, behavioral, and developmental problems. While we do know that BPA is dangerous, we don't yet know how much it could possibly impact our society. But BPA remains widely used in many consumer products, from electronics to medical equipment and it's in the resin of can linings and in plastic bottles where it can leach into the food or liquid contents inside. The Food and Drug Administration, which has jurisdiction over food packaging, says BPA is safe at the low doses that occur in food. But many research and health organizations remain concerned about BPA's impact on human health at current levels of exposure. Over 1.5 million tons of flame retardants are used worldwide each year. They're added to consumer products to meet flammability standards, though their effectiveness remains questionable. There are many different kinds of flame retardants. Among the most studied are polybrominated diphenyl ethers, or PBDEs. Scientists have linked PBDEs to a wide range of conditions, from delayed development to learning problems and diminished intelligence. Two PBDEs, Penta and Octa, were taken off the U.S. market voluntarily in 2004 because of growing health concerns. Production of the PBDE, DECA, is in the process of being terminated. The flame retardants Chlorinated Tris and Firemaster 550 which may be linked to DNA damage, cancer, or neurological defects, continue to be widely used in polyurethane foam in a number of common children's products. When it comes to endocrine disruptors, one of the most toxic places is your home. Some people are more exposed to chemicals because of the job they do or where they live. Low-income and minority communities often live near points of pollution like chemical plants and waste dump sites, or in aged and substandard housing. And these communities share a disproportionate burden of disease. Well, somehow we have industrial chemicals floating around in our bodies. You'd think one of those would be enough, but 232 it's kind of hard to say what's going on. I don't want to 
take the chance of buying something that could be really bad for my family. Well, that's the gang. Chances are, you bought them already. <laughs> I'd struggled with fertility and repeated miscarriages. And as I searched for an answer to why, um, why I was having such a hard time carrying a baby to term, I discovered the connection between our environment, our toxic exposures, and our health, particularly our reproductive health. What we don't know can really hurt us. And there's a lot that we don't know. 80% of the common chemicals in everyday use in this country, we know almost nothing about from our own studies, we've tested 200 people, we found 482 chemicals, and there are 15,000 chemicals out there in heavy use. How many are showing up in our blood? How many of them might pose a risk? We have no idea what the long-term health implications of these results are. And I do not want my son or anyone's children to be our scientific experiment. The American people expect that all chemicals used in the American economy are safe. But Mr. Chairman, the 30-year-old law that gives EPA that authority is outdated. It is outdated. There are hundreds of chemicals in the environment that are coming from products that we are using every day. And these chemicals were declared safe dozens of years ago. And now we understand that they can disrupt the endocrine system, the controlling system of our bodies. Well, our hormone systems are very complex. And everybody must understand it goes beyond the usual sex hormones. There are a lot of hormones. Insulin is a hormone. I don't think most people understand that. And we have an epidemic of diabetes and obesity all connected in the Northern Hemisphere that now, basically, uh, some of the most recent studies and even a human study showed a link between a very commonly used plastic called bisphenol A and diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular problems. What we used to think was that we could use high-dose testing to predict what's going to happen at low levels. That's how all regulatory toxicology works. We used to think that that was sufficient. But that was before um, we began to realize that some contaminants, like bisphenol A, behave like hormones. And the people that study hormones, endocrinologists, have known for years that what happens at high doses isn't necessarily the same as what happens at low doses. So all of a sudden, as toxicology is confronted with this new way of looking at chemical action, they have to throw out one of their most basic assumptions, that the dose makes the poison. The numbers are so small that they're beyond the comprehension of most people. That's how small they are. So you think of a part per thousand, a part per million, a part per billion, a part per trillion. A natural hormone below a part per trillion, it can stimulate breast cancer cells to grow. And now we are seeing chemicals like bisphenol A that are what hard, clear plastic is made out of and the lining of cans is made out of. It can stimulate breast cancer cells at below a part per trillion, just like the natural hormone. The easiest concept for people to remember is that this hand and the fin of a dolphin and the wing of a bat at the early embryo stage, they look identical. And inside of the wing of a bat and inside of the fin of the dolphin is a hand. So at the beginning of development of a fish or a frog, or a mouse, or a human, the early stages of development that are disrupted by endocrine disruptors and the genetic mechanisms are almost identical. We end up looking different, but don't let that deceive you. 
the mechanisms of development are very, very similar, and the disruption events of development lead to diseases in all of these species. We have proven that in animals, if you expose during the time that you start out, your body starts out as one single cell and then becomes two cells and four cells and many cells. And we know that as one cell is becoming many other cells, the hormones that control that, if you disrupt them, then you permanently alter the genes in the new cells. And when you do that at the beginning of life, those cells and all of the cells that come from them are defective. And the consequence is that, for instance, after puberty, when the reproductive system starts forming, abnormalities in the organs that after puberty begin to develop, like the female uterus, suddenly you start to see diseases of that organ. You don't see the disease in a child because the uterus is not functioning yet. So not just one system, this could be the development of the brain, which basically the brain at that time is getting programmed for how an individual is going to develop later in life as well. So their behavior is being affected. Intelligence could be affected. My involvement in the whole pesticide issue was sort of a surprise as well when I was approached by the largest chemical company in the world and they asked me if I would evaluate how atrazine affected amphibians or my frogs. Turns out atrazine is the largest selling product for the largest chemical company in the world. It's the number one contaminant of groundwater, drinking water, rainwater. In 2003, after my studies, it was banned in the European Union, but in that same year, the United States EPA re-registered the compound. We were a bit surprised when we found out that when we exposed frogs to very low levels of atrazine, 0.1 parts per billion, that it produced animals that look like this. this these are the dissected gonads of an animal that has two testes, two ovaries, another large testis, more ovaries, which is not normal, <laughs> even for amphibians. In some cases, in other species, like the North American leopard frog, we showed that males exposed to atrazine grew eggs in their testes, and you can see these large yoked up eggs bursting through the surface of this male's testis. What we proposed and what we've now generated support for is that what atrazine is doing is wreaking havoc causing a hormone imbalance. Normally the testis should make testosterone, the male hormone, but what atrazine does is it turns on an enzyme, the machinery, if you will, aromatase, that converts testosterone into estrogen. And as a result, these exposed males lose their testosterone, they're chemically castrated, and they're subsequently feminized because now they're making the female hormone. Now this is what brought me to the human-related issues, because it turns out that the number one cancer in women, breast cancer, is regulated by estrogen and by this enzyme aromatase. So when you develop a cancerous cell in your breast, aromatase converts androgens into estrogens, and that estrogen turns on or promotes the growth of that cancer so that it turns into a tumor and spreads. In fact, this aromatase is so important in breast cancer that the latest treatment for breast cancer is a chemical called letrozole, which blocks aromatase, blocks estrogen, so that if you develop the mutated cell, it doesn't grow into a tumor. Now what's interesting is, of course, that we're still using 80 million pounds of atrazine, the number one contaminant in drinking water, that does the opposite, turns on aromatase, increases estrogen, and promotes tumors in rats, and is associated with tumors, breast cancer, in humans. What's interesting is, in fact, the same company that sold us 80 million pounds of atrazine, the breast cancer promoter, now sells us the blocker, the exact same company. And so I find it interesting that instead of treating this disease by preventing exposure to the chemicals that promote it, we simply respond by putting more chemicals into the environment.
I tell my college students, because I'm a professor, that the men in this class probably have half the amount of sperm in their testes than I do. Can you imagine? I am three times their age, and I am more than twice the man they are. New science is raising some scary questions. Is fertility declining, especially among men? Back in the 1990s, a controversial Danish study painted a dire picture that suggested sperm counts were falling at such a rapid rate that there would be almost no sperm left in 50 years. Is there really this 50% decline in 50 years in male sperm counts? Big deal. So I was skeptical. Skeptical, but still intrigued. Swan decided to do her own test. She came up with the same results as the Danish researchers. Then she looked at the sperm counts of men in Missouri, New York, Minnesota, and California. The men in central Missouri had about half as many moving sperm. Swan had a theory about what was going on. Could it be chemicals in the environment? There are 80,000 chemicals in commerce, and most of them have not been tested. There's no question that pesticides can reduce sperm count. The question is, how much do you need to do the damage? Last year, Swan looked at another population, university and college-aged males in Rochester, New York. Men, just like these swimmers, considered to be at their physical peak, their prime of life. And what did you find? First of all, that their sperm quality was not great. 23% of the men had counts, which would be grounds for going for seeing an infertility doctor. But some scientists say we're worrying about the wrong thing. Perhaps it's not the quantity of sperm that counts. What you do have to worry about is the quality of the sperm. Dr. Keith Jarvie says it can be a game of chance. I mean, I have guys coming in with two or three million sperm. They have kids someone who looks very similar sitting opposite me with 20 or 25 million sperm having difficulty having children so there's something about the sperm that we can't necessarily measure it's basically las vegas if you have more sperm you're more likely to roll good dice when a man orgasms during sex millions of microscopic tadpole-like organisms swim for their lives with one goal in mind to fertilize a waiting egg but only the strongest swimmer will make it to its destination. Semen concentrations declined 32% from an average of 73.6 million per milliliter in 1989 to 49.9 million per milliliter in 2005, lower than the World Health Organization's suggested threshold of 55 million. Research has suggested endocrine disruptors may be behind the decline as they affect the body's hormonal system by mimicking or blocking normal hormones in the body. Sometimes there may not be any sperm in the ejaculate or the sperm may not be swimming in a straight line. That's called a motility problem. Other times their shape just isn't right. That's a morphology problem. Then there's the biological clock. Men have one too. It just ticks a little differently. As women age, their supply of eggs dwindles drastically. In men, the sperm is still there, but the quality changes. They don't move as fast, they're the wrong shape, and more of the DNA is damaged. There has been studies showing that when the father is older and the mother is young, the incidence of autism and the incidence of schizophrenia is higher. Uh, some studies are only one and a half times higher, other studies are up to four or five times higher. But regardless of the potential risks, medical science has turned its attention to solving the problem of the endangered male. One thing that we do know for certain is that there are certain forms of male infertility that by their very presence we know that they will be transmitted to the offspring. It's long been known cancer can rob a man of his fertility. But what if you flip that equation? 
What if infertility was a sign, a marker that a man might be more likely to develop cancer? New research suggests infertility may only be the first health battle men will fight. We can say with, with absolute certainty that amongst the risk factors that we count for testis cancer, infertility is absolutely one of them. How high of a risk? Threefold. Dr. Thomas Walsh has published studies on the possible links between infertility and cancer. And testis cancer wasn't the only risk, according to a 2010 study. Specifically, those men who were infertile and had abnormal semen quality were about two and a half times more likely to develop high grade, so clinically significant prostate cancer, and that their infertility was preceding their development of prostate cancer by five to ten years. Not only does infertility appear to increase the risk of prostate cancer, but the kind that could be deadly. It's another level at which doctors are just beginning to understand infertility and its potential consequences. Many chemicals that have been designed uh, and used over the years have ended up in places where they weren't expected. They've ended up in breast milk, they've ended up in children's umbilical cord blood, they've ended up in wildlife. They weren't expected to be there. When that happens, that means that chemical is behaving in ways that wasn't anticipated. And we should at that point reverse course rather than continuing to plow ahead, waiting for evidence of proof of harm before we decide to change course. I see this as a kind of massive experiment that we're all part of. Through chemistry, you don't just get better living. You get serious, adverse health effects. Chemicals can go into commerce, um, assumed to be safe. And there are about 80,000 chemicals in commerce. Very, very few of them have been tested, and almost none of them have been banned. What's showing up in household dust is also showing up in our bodies. Toxic chemicals are absorbed through our skin, breathed into our lungs, and digested through our water and food. Groundbreaking tests have found the same chemicals in people's blood, hair, and urine. The endocrine system is important for human and animal health because it regulates and controls hormones and important functions like metabolism, growth, development, sleep and mood. And this importance increases at critical life stages such as infancy and childhood. Some chemicals might be harmful if our bodies are overexposed to them. So how do we know when we are overexposed to them? The first step is to establish the amount or the dose of a chemical required for the body to respond and produce an effect and to determine how much is acceptable or tolerable for the body. There is a famous quote by Paracelsus, a 16th century Swiss uh, scientist, that says, all substances are poisons, it's the dose that makes the poison. This means that the higher the dose of a chemical, the greater the response and the effect, and as a consequence, the likelihood of an adverse effect. It also means that for most chemicals, there is a threshold dose below which there is no adverse effect. Based on the th threshold, we can establish safe levels for substances such as food additives, flavorings, pesticides, and so on. However, some substances, known as endocrine active substances, that behave similarly to human hormones may cause adverse effects at low doses, but not necessarily at all higher doses. These chemicals have different kinds of dose response curves. For instance, this U-shaped curve with high response, both at the low and high dose range, but not at the intermediate dose range. It would be impossible to calculate a threshold and consequently to establish a safe level for these chemicals. They're substances that interact with or interfere with hormones in the endocrine system. When this leads to adverse effects, they are called endocrine disruptors. Humans and animals may be exposed to a wide range of endocrine active substances. These can be naturally occurring, such as phytoestrogens in soya, 
or synthetic, like dioxins and some pesticides. We endorse the World Health Organization definition that an endocrine disruptor is defined by three criteria. The presence of an adverse effect, the presence of endocrine activity, and a causal relationship between the two. In other words, that the endocrine activity leads to an adverse effect. Not all scientists and regulators agree on a distinction between endocrine active substances and endocrine disruptors, but we believe that this is important. So what we are confronting here is still an imperfect world of knowledge because we know that of these 140,000 chemicals, many of them simply exist. Many and an increasing number is being used and many are also entering into cycles that we may not have envisaged or that we did not anticipate or that we simply do not know about. We are now much more than we may think living in a world of chemicals. Another point to illustrate uh, the, um, what we call the chemical intensification, if you wish, of the economy is the fact that it's spreading uh, in the daily life. Chemicals are not just used for discrete issues here and there. They are completely spread over in daily life uh, through the penetration of chemical intensive products um, in, I would say, in the, in the average product that we're using. We are now looking more and more at studies that document the high level of POPs, persistent organic pollutants, uh, including in aquatic mammals, polar bears, fish-eating birds. So it's going up into the food chain. And uh, there is evidence as well that uh, these contaminants are responsible for the near extinction of some species over the world. costs, obviously, and um, there <coughs> are very interesting uh, evidence that unsound management of chemical bear very high costs. Um, just, just one example that I think you'll find in this, uh, in this report as well. Uh, if you look at the estimated cost of poisoning uh, from pesticide in sub-Saharan Africa, only the injury and the loss of working time. I'm not talking about projection of uh, whatever um, future uh, revenues or, you know, really only that is estimated to be 6.3 billion uh, US dollars in 2009. This is higher than the total ODA that is going to the health sector in the same area. And this is 17 years after Theo Colborn's book, Our Stolen Future, and it will be 14 years after the EU EDC strategy was first published. So during all this time, the exposure continues and the scientific concerns have been rising. One of the most important lessons that we've learned is that children are uniquely susceptible to the toxic chemicals and other factors in the environment. For a number of reasons, infants and youngsters up to age four have much higher levels of many problem chemicals in their bodies than adults do. And scientists have begun to pin down the causes. First of all, children have greater exposure pound for pound than adults. They eat more food, they drink more water, they breathe more air per pound of body weight. So they take into their body more of any toxic chemicals that are in food, air, and water. And then on top of that, kids' exposure is further magnified because they live on the floor, they crawl around a few inches above the rug, they're constantly putting their hands, their toys, their lollipops in their mouths, and so all of those, all of those factors increase their exposure.
they're they're biologically more vulnerable than we adults. Their nervous system, their reproductive organs, their immune system, their lungs, all the organs in their body are undergoing very, very rapid growth and development. And those developmental processes are very fragile, they're very easily upset. And unfortunately, if development is perturbed at a vulnerable early stage by some chemical like lead or pesticides or PCB, the damage in many cases is irreparable. It can't be cured, it can't be treated, it results in lifelong impairment. So this was on time a number of years ago and we're concerned about development being an, uh, a time in life where there is disruption of the genetic control systems that can lead to disease much later in life. So it's the developmental origin of health and disease and the primary focus has been on drugs, stress, nutrition, infections, and only recently has there been also a fair amount of information coming out about environmental chem chemicals exerting these changes. And it's very clear, a bad start in life, you know, you have a totally different type of life. And what we're finding out is an event called epigenetics is what turns out to be, in all likelihood, the mechanism by which these chemicals are able to cause this harm. So epigenetics essentially refers to any change in DNA that is not a classical mutation, all right? So when I was in school, this is what I was taught. And this is what I now teach in my uh, reproductive endocrinology class. That it isn't just the genes you have, which certainly matter, but it's whether the control systems that turn those genes on and off are programmed right. And it's hormones that do that. We were struck by the fact that rates of a whole series of chronic diseases are rising in American children. We see increases in, in, in so many diseases that are preventable. Asthma has tripled over the past 20 years. Obesity has tripled. Childhood cancer has risen by 40%. Certain birth defects have doubled. Autism has increased to alarming rates. We all care about the next generation. Um, that's our future. Parents are often overwhelmed by the sheer volume of information about environmental threats to, to children's health. It is possible, it is definitely possible for parents to take action to protect their children against many of the most serious environmental threats to health. All parents need is knowledge. It's our job, it's our mission to give them that knowledge. We have changed people's minds and influence policy. We want our children and our children's children to be as healthy and productive as possible. Now, if you're pregnant, the children are you've got quite enough to worry about. But now, obstetricians and gynecologists are advising you to think about avoiding things like the non stick frying pans and new cars. The items are on a list of potential but unproven risks from exposure to environmental chemicals in pregnancy. The device has been labelled unhelpful, unrealistic and alarmist. This not right. The reaction in the newsroom this morning was that these were pretty extreme guidelines. Do you intend pregnant women to stick to all of them rigidly? What the document outlines is the fact that for a, a while, we have been concerned about certain chemicals that may be present in our environment. We do not know what the risks are, but we wish to make women more aware of this, giving them the information that they might find helpful uh, so that they can make decisions, uh, you know, to change their lifestyle. The problem um, with determining effects of any chemical exposure, especially mixtures of different chemicals, means that it's a long 
time, it'll be a long time before we would even know if there are any risks. What we hope to do with this document is ha have a proactive approach so that we could give women um, the information and so they can make informed choices. Those most threatened by toxic chemicals are not adults. They are children and babies. But the most vulnerable of all have not even been born. The early development of the embryo is identical for men and women, okay? The sexual differences begin to develop later, and it's really because if there's a Y chromosome that comes from the man, that causes the embryo to develop testes. And testes cause the uh, result in the secretion of testosterone. And therefore, that modifies the developing embryo to develop as a male. Because the Y chromosome is the male chromosome. So all you ladies have XX chromosomes. We poor males have X and Y. And the Y chromosome makes the embryo masculine by causing a testis to develop. There are other genes too, I'm not going to take you through, but the main thing is that it leads, the testis leads to the secretion of testosterone, which modifies the embryo to develop as a male. There is no question that the most serious effects are to the unborn child. Because the effects are permanent, and because the fetus has very few defenses against these chemicals. This is a time when all the cells are starting to divide from each other, developing into organs. Uh, and this can start as early as six weeks, even earlier after conception. Until recently, doctors believed that the fetus was protected from contamination by the placental barrier. But the womb provides no such protection. Everything that the mother is exposed to could potentially expose the fetus. The difference is that the fetus is exquisitely sensitive, many, many more times more sensitive than the mother, and so it's much more dangerous. These test tubes contain umbilical cord blood. We've analyzed thousands of them and found pollutants such as heavy metals, organochlorine pesticides, PCBs, and... That means that the mother was exposed to these pollutants and transmitted them through her bloodstream to her unborn child. Progress is merciless. After Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, we now have Homo toxicus. We're all familiar with the idea of inheritance and DNA. We're all familiar with the idea that the environment affects the development of the child. What we now realise is that these two are much more intertwined than we've known before. That the environment actually affects the DNA. And this is the new exciting science of epigenetics. The mice are agouti mice. One is kind of really much bigger and yellow, and the other one's much smaller and brown. Neither have a disease. Um, they're the same species, but obviously they look really different. They've got the same DNA. They are genetically identical, so there's no reason genetically why they should have these differences. Well, what we now realise is that changes to the DNA are possible, so-called epigenetic changes. That means on top of genetics. The DNA has the instructions for how we function and how we're going to develop. Um, but the epigenetics will change whether or not it's red and how it's red. So typically when we think of DNA, we think of a double helix, but actually DNA is tightly called around proteins called histones, 
and depending on the spacing between these histone proteins that will determine whether or not the machinery that's going to read the DNA is able to access it. So obviously if you've got really nice spacing the DNA in between the histones is able to be read but if it's bunched together you just can't get at it and there's no way that the machinery can read the DNA and interpret the instructions that it contains. And what happens is that new chemical groups are added to the DNA and these control whether the gene is turned on or off or if it's turned on how much it's turned on. The methyl group sits on the DNA and essentially blocks it from being read so that the gene is inactive. The only difference is what their mothers ate during pregnancy. If you feed the pregnant mother mouse a normal diet then uh, the gene which is responsible for the yellow coat colour, that's still switched on and being read. But if you feed the pregnant mother mouse a diet rich in supplements, which have lots of methyl donors, which block this gene from being read, that means that it has the brown colour and it's much leaner and it's less likely to suffer from things like diabetes, obesity and cancer. Epigenetics is still quite a young science and there's a lot we don't understand about it. But we do understand that these marks to the DNA can last right through a person's lifetime. It's not nature or nurture, it's nurture affecting nature in a way that we're starting to understand at the molecular level. After birth, the infant is further exposed to chemicals in the mother's breast milk. There's no question that when you show that mother's milk has contaminants and then you actually look at babies and you can actually take a blood sample or a urine sample and show that those contaminants are not only in that child but they stay in that child. Genetics plays a potentially very important role in determining the effects of early life exposures on children's health and development. So for example we, we're looking at the effects of environmental exposures, physical toxicants in the environment, common everyday pollutants that we experience, particularly in urban areas, air pollutants, uh, bisphenol A, phthalates, pesticides, at the low levels to which we're generally exposed. So we're inter and we have observed some relationships between uh, fetal exposures, prenatal exposures, and health effects in children following a cohort of children for a number of years from in utero forward into childhood and even adolescence. So uh, we look upon epigenetics as uh, a potentially very important mechanism in mediating those effects and in linking, helping us to link exposures to the clinical outcomes that we're measuring. And, uh, and in doing so, elucidate the mechanisms by which this damage is incurring which we hope very much will be useful in prevention, in designing effective interventions, and also in monitoring the efficacy of those interventions. We're specifically uh, hypothesizing that prenatal exposure to environmental contaminants, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons from fossil fuel burning, other combustion sources, secondhand tobacco smoke, uh, pesticides used for control of indoor pests in urban areas, uh, and uh, what's, what are called uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, bisphenol A and phthalates, that they are uh, having an effect when the fetus is exposed through the mother's environmental exposure, that they are having an effect on children's neurodevelopment, neurobehavior particularly, um, on asthma risk uh, and obesity and metabolic disorders and further that they may be increasing the risk of intermediate damage associated with cancer. So we further theorize that in addition to genotoxic pathways that can be important for some of these chemical exposures, pollutant exposures, that epigenetics may be involved. And we're studying that both within our cohorts of mothers and newborns who are enrolled uh, during the pregnancy period and then followed uh, for many years into uh, adolescence. Our oldest children are now approaching the age of 12 and 13. Um, we, we theorize that we will be able to do, draw better links between those early exposures and the outcomes 
uh, by uh, understanding and measuring the epigenetic changes, both um, uh, that we determine in the cord blood at birth, uh, looking also at placental tissue, and then further following and analyzing the samples from those children at older ages. So we further theorize that the prenatal period will be a window of exquisite susceptibility to these exposures. Uh, so those are our hypotheses. We're not leaving out, however, the broader context, the social uh, context in which, uh, in which individuals are, are living, to which they're um, reacting on a daily basis. So we are um, looking at psychosocial stressors, uh, also genetic susceptibility, because we think there's an important interaction between genetic susceptibility and, and other environmental factors, and nutritional factors. So our studies are attempting to capture those things as best we can uh, and to look at the, um, at the relationships among them. I think that through more understanding of the pathways that are involved in the effects that are observed in relation to early life exposures, prenatal and early postnatal exposures, that through that understanding, we can craft really effective and targeted interventions. Those will include behavioral interventions, educational programs, for example, uh, nutritional interventions, and people are talking about pharmacological interventions as well. Um, my area focusing on uh, preventable environmental exposures, um, in, in my area, we tend to think of policy changes that can dramatically affect uh, the environment of, of, of a population and actually dealing especially with involuntary exposures that are problematic, such as, for example, air pollution. So uh, we think uh, in terms of how scientific data can inform policies, um, regulatory and other kinds of policies to address those environmental threats. I mentioned uh, our uh, exploring really, the word is exploring the interactions between the environmental exposures, the physical toxicants that we're interested in, and the other factors, genetic susceptibility, nutritional susceptibility, psychosocial stressors, all of which can worsen, exacerbate the effect of the physical toxicants. Those studies, because, because our cohorts are fairly limited in size, we enrolled 700 and about 740 women in pregnancy and are following them and their children. Um, those are fairly limited. Uh, we consider them to be exploratory, but, uh, but it's important to, to attempt to, to uh, assess those at this point, and then hopefully we'll be able to do larger studies in the future. I think we're only just beginning to realize how important that cocktail effect is. It's extremely difficult to study. Uh, it's expensive, time-consuming. But what the, what the animal studies, very carefully conducted animal studies, have shown is that when you take these chemicals at levels at which individual chemicals have no effect, then together they can have big effects. And again, the effects that we're talking about that have been studied so far are on male reproductive development, so they will include this time window of vulnerability. Um, and the implications of that are enormous because it means that when you look at one chemical that we may be exposed to low levels of and which is, you may think this will have no effect, you can't look at it like that. You must say, what else are you exposed to and how will those add up? So you, you move in a, what we call dose additive way uh, from no effect on each of the chemicals to combining them and having a very large effect. So I think it's something that everyone is familiar with. If you go to the doctor, your doctor says, what else are you taking before I prescribe this, right? But we don't do that with the chemicals. There's always been a mythology about pregnancy, but now actually some of that mythology is turning out to be rather more true than we expected. We're starting to realize that the months we spend in the womb are some of the most important of our lives. So what happens in the womb can last a lifetime. We're just beginning to understand that chemistry. 
That chemistry operates in the range of parts per trillion and parts per billion, which industry has told us for years it's harmless. Concentrations like that are unimportant. But when you interrupt a vital system, something that's developing where these eggs are splitting and developing and budding and forming legs and arms and duct systems and glands, at a part per trillion, these are very dangerous chemicals. Fred Von Saul of the University of Missouri and Don Tillett of the U.S. Geological Survey live and work in the nation's heartland. Alarmed by rising numbers of wild animals found with bizarre developmental and reproductive problems, they've joined a national effort to find the cause. The prime suspects include pesticides, the residue of birth control pills and other drugs in treated wastewater, and the compound found in many familiar plastics, bisphenol A. The problem with chemicals such as bisphenol A is it breaks out of the plastic and leaches into water. Studies show that from water, this chemical can get into animals. And there it can act like a dose of the female sex hormone, estrogen. Too much estrogen can disrupt the endocrine system, and that's been linked to a wide range of health impacts, including gender bending. One critical unanswered question is at what level of exposure these effects occur. With bisphenol A, we're talking about extremely small quantities of this chemical getting into the environment. Samples drawn from this stream had only 30 parts per trillion. Vamsal is worried because studies show tiny amounts of bisphenol A can derail early cell development in mice. And if mice are vulnerable, might people be as well? Recently, Vamsal tested clear plastic baby bottles to see if they release bisphenol A. He devised the simplest of experiments. Let distilled water sit in brand new bottles for 24 hours and then test it. Every one released bisphenol A. Curious, he then decided to see what happens when the same baby bottles are run through an ordinary dishwasher, which heats them to 140 degrees. Some of these bottles, by the time we had washed them 10 times, were leaching 10 times more bisphenol A than they had before they had been washed. The plastics industry vigorously disputes any danger to children from the chemical. They cite the continued blessing of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Bisphenol A, or BPA, is a chemical that is much discussed these days. BPA is the essential ingredient used to manufacture both polycarbonate plastics and epoxy resins. Polycarbonate is a transparent plastic providing solidity, lightweight, and shatter resistance to a wide variety of products. From solar panels to mobile phone casings, from safety helmets to car bumpers or to DVDs, to name just a few of its many applications. Epoxy resins are mostly used as coatings. They provide excellent anti-corrosion and antibacterial protection as well as elasticity and versatility. Applications using epoxies range from sports equipment to car parts, from tin cans to construction panels, from wind turbine blades to tankers or home appliances. You name it. But what about the BPA that is bonded in these materials? Is it safe? Scientists from academia, government and industry have been studying BPA extensively over the years. In fact, no other chemical has undergone such a wide range of testing. Research shows that we absorb very low levels of BPA when drinking or eating from material made using BPA. Our body is very effective at quickly transforming these very low BPA residues into an inactive kind of sugar, which we excrete via the urine rapidly. But recently, Controversy has emerged among scientists about the possibility that BPA may have harmful effects on humans. Some scientists claim that BPA causes or contributes to cause a series of diseases. 
While others confirm that, as it is used safely, bisphenol A has no harmful effects on humans. So what are the facts? Is there a cause for concern? Like other chemicals, be they natural or man-made, BPA can weakly act like an estrogen, the primary female sex hormone. Does this intake of external estrogen cause any damage to our hormonal system? Many things we eat each day trigger hormonal changes in our bodies with no adverse effect. For example, carrots and soybeans contain natural hormone-like chemical components. The levels at which we are exposed to BPA do not raise concerns for any damage to our hormonal systems. And many of these estrogen-like compounds are far more active than BPA. In fact, one person would have to eat 600 kilos of food in contact with BPA-based polycarbonate utensils to ingest the same amount of estrogen-like compounds that he would absorb from eating a 150 grams plate of carrots. BPA has been found in urine and blood samples of people affected with diseases such as cancer, obesity, or diabetes. There are many different risk factors for these diseases, and often they're associated with lifestyle and behaviors. Physical inactivity, unhealthy diets, drinking, and smoking are all identified risk factors. The mere presence of BPA in blood and urine samples does not mean it causes cancer, obesity, or diabetes. For example, people drinking beverages from cans coated with epoxy resins will display some BPA in their urine. But to reach a level at which BPA would become harmful, a 60 kilos person would have to drink more than 1,800 cans a day. So, for BPA, as for any other chemical, let's look at the facts, investigate examples, and use our best judgment before jumping to any hasty conclusion as regards the safety of a product which plays a key role in food and sanitary protection. From recreation to food, from convenience to shelter, BPA brings many benefits to our daily lives. And while we may have questions on its effects, research and experience show that BPA is safe. It's not lost on some of you that that is special interest blabber. Uh, we heard that from the American Tobacco Institute for years, remember? Three studies are equivocal about whether smoking causes cancer. The record shows that many of the country's most respected doctors openly challenge anti-cigarette claims. A California doctor said, as a scientist, I find no persuasive evidence that cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. A New York doctor told Congress to claim there is now sufficient scientific evidence to establish that cigarette smoking causes disease is, in my opinion, unjustified. There is another side to the cigarette controversy. It's all here in this white paper. Sent for it. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Tens of thousands of doctors in all branches of medicine in all parts of the country were asked that question. The brand named most was Camel. Smoke Camel, the cigarette so many doctors enjoy. This new insect destroyer contains a lot of DDT. Its DDT content is even higher than government specifications. Ideal for vertical surfaces, on fruit and vegetable stands, in cupboards, and it's perfect for ridding Fido of those unwelcome house guests. This contemporary home shows how modern asbestos materials can be adapted to any style or design. Notice how the asbestos cement sidewalls help add dignity and charm. Oh, it is attractive. Yes, and it'll stay that way, too. That's what I like about it. And, and they correctly said, and still to this day, we do not know biophysically the precise links between smoking and cancer. So they give you a therefore, when there's no therefore there, therefore it's premature to act. That's a personal value judgment or risk management. Of course, they want to they protect market share. Whereas the data are so overwhelming epidemiologically, you know, the statistics, 
that you'd have to be crazy not to control this, even though you don't understand every detail of the mechanisms. How many people in this place, in this fire-prone California, have had a house fire? A few of you. Typically, it's one to two percent. How many of you have fire insurance? We already are very risk averse when we have consequences that matter. We do not need 95% certainty. Supposing you got a spot on your lung from a chest x-ray, which you did for a different purpose than looking for cancer. Well, it could be a healed lesion or it could be the beginning of a tumor. So they were asked what to do. Well, what should we do, doc? Well, do a biopsy. Well, it's hard to get to. We have to do surgery. Surgery has risks. It's expensive. It's painful. In other words, there's a price for a false positive. If you believe that that could be cancer and you try to take it out, you will pay a price. So, okay, we don't want to pay the price, so let's wait and see. What can we do? And the doc said, well, you can wait, and if it grows, then we better take it out. And of course, this patient said, but what's the chance that if I wait and it grows, that it becomes metastatic and therefore it'll be too late and I'll be dead, whereas if I take it out now in a precautionary mode, pay the price for the surgery I might not need, I'll have a lower likelihood of being dead. Now, what's the right answer to that? There is no right answer. That's your value judgment. It means that you're leaving it up to the public and the political world to figure that out for themselves. They're capable of it, but they rarely do it. Who's making all the decisions? I mean, who's really pulling the strings? There are chemicals being used that we know cause serious illnesses and contaminate the environment. Why are they still being produced when safer alternatives are out there? Where's the regulation? In mid-April, from the National Toxicology Program of the National Institutes of Health, that there is, quote, some concern about neural and behavioral effects of the BPA on fetuses, infants, and children. The response from the recent study of the FDA uh, of, of the National Toxicology Program has simply promised more studies, not any concrete action to reduce exposure. The media has reported that the federal government's reluctance to regulate these chemicals is based on the reliance of biased studies from the chemical industry itself. Now, I have to tell you, if that's true, if it's not being done independently or by yourselves, but by an industry study, doesn't that cast amazing doubt on the ability of the regulatory system to actually protect the public? Senator, at, at FDA, all of our products that we approve are based on data that are prepared and conducted in studies by that particular manufacturer. But doesn't that bother you? That's my point. You don't seem to see the connection here. Chemicals that go into the manufacture of other products intended for young children, polyvinyl chloride softens because of the existence of phthalates. It's still used in the manufacture of children's toys, bath books, rattles, beach balls, plastic raincoats, boots, even teething rings. And it can be absorbed from those products during use into a young child's body. Uh, the fact is that a biomonitoring study coordinated by EWG, the Environmental Working Group, tested the umbilical cord blood from 10 babies who'd been born in the United States in August and September of 2004. These newborns were found to have absorbed in the womb a combined total of 413 chemicals. At birth, each child carried an average body burden of 200 chemicals. And those chemicals included pesticides, flame retardants, and other persistent organic compounds or byproducts from burning gasoline and garbage. The EWG also tested the breast milk of 29 first-time mothers from across the United States for the presence of components of chemical flame retardants, TVs, foam furniture, all of which can cause thyroid toxicity, and some of which have been banned in Europe. And the results were very sobering. The breast milk of each new mother tested positive for components of flame retardants. The average level of brominated fire retardants in the milk samples was 75 times higher than the average for women who'd been tested in Europe and were at levels associated with toxic effects in studies on lab animals. I mean, I, you can go on and on. Do you, do you read these studies? Do they not concern you?
Sir, we, we've read all the studies you're talking about. Well, why don't you ban phthalates? There's a movement in California to ban them now. There's a movement in Europe, other places. People, uh, there's a lot of study in rats uh, and others. Uh, are you familiar with those studies? That show that I personally am not, but I'm sure the scientists at FDRA who redu review these materials every day are. Well, does the commission not talk about this? Do you commissioners not talk about this? You well, we talk about these issues on a regular basis, Senator. A team at Boston Tufts University, led by Professor Soto, studied the effects of phthalate exposure in rats. They exposed pregnant rats to bisphenol A, BPA, chemical, uh, and uh, the levels to which the rats were exposed mirrored levels that humans encounter daily. The results, by the time they reached puberty, rats that had been received even the lowest doses of BPA had four times more precancerous growths in breast tissue than those that had not been exposed. Think it's okay for people to go ahead and use this stuff? I mean, doesn't this concern you? Senator, it, it does concern us. Well, how much does it concern you? Enough that you, all you do is just rely on what, what a study that comes from the industry itself? You should go to their website today and read what they say about phthalates, completely contrary to what is out there in scientific journals. It's a disgrace. And it obviously doesn't concern you enough to do something about it. There are thousands upon thousands of chemicals. 80,000 chemicals are out there in the marketplace today. Something like less than 6,000 have been properly vetted and tested. And we're still living with the residue of the Toxic Control Substances Act that was written by the industry, with a burden of proof on our citizens to prove harm done, not on people to prove that it won't be done. Under the Toxic Substances Control Act, or TOSCA, the burden is on the Environmental Protection Agency to show that an industrial chemical is unsafe. EPA can only ask the company for data or require testing if EPA can prove that there is a potential risk. And that's hard to do without access to the company's data in the first place. But looking at low dose exposures means a sea change in how we do toxicological testing and risk assessment. And that's controversial, costly, and something the chemical industry opposes. And, and I tell you, we're, I mean, I could go on and on. I've ex used my time here, and it's not appropriate to abuse it. But I, I just think the job is not being done, sir. I have to tell you. And I don't think the American uh, public is being adequately protected. And I think it, we're going to have to find this law has got to be rewritten. And we've got to start to, to do what we're supposed to do, not what uh, the industry always asks us to do. You have any response? None. Think everything's okay? Senator, as studies become available to us, we at FDA apply the Studies them. from whom become Whoever. available to you? If they've been... No, the only studies you're getting right now, have you asked for studies from independent sources? We don't normally ask for independence. Then you don't protect the American people if you don't ask for them. If you don't look beyond what's handed to you. The chemical industry, scientists, and environmentalists all agree that change is needed. But efforts at reforming legislation are currently stalled between the chemical industry's push for profit and safety advocates drive to protect the public from harm. Let's see how it works in practice. REACH was the European Commission's ambitious proposal to create rules to protect citizens and the environment from dangerous chemicals. The idea was to require the chemical industry to demonstrate the safety of its products and to substitute chemicals of very high concern with safer alternatives. 
Frightened by the potential financial impact on their business, the chemical industry launched a multi-million euro campaign to kill off the REACH proposal. The corporate lobby groups started working their revolving doors, with staff moving to and from the very commission department that was writing the legislation, DG Enterprise. Its director, John Paul Mingerson, was headhunted as general advisor for lobbying giant Business Europe. Meanwhile, chemical multinational BASF was found to be funding advisors within DG Enterprise and seconded more than 200 of its staff members to the German government. A lobbyist from the German Chemical Federation, VCI, also acted as an advisor to key members of the European Parliament. All this gave big chemical corporations privileged access to political information and made it far easier to influence the decisions. Their huge lobbying campaign proved to be enormously successful, REACH entered into force in 2007, but was dramatically watered down with many loopholes allowing many of the more dangerous chemicals to remain on the market. The EU's legislation regulating chemicals is not sufficient to determine whether substances have endocrine disrupting properties and lacks data requirements. The matter is being taken very seriously by the European Parliament, where a resolution was adopted in 2013 in order to identify and ban harmful endocrine disruptors. The potential risks to health are great, including cancers and developmental abnormalities for newborns. La pression que nous devons faire sur la Commission doit être totale. D'un côté, contre nous, nous avons un lobbying effréné de la part de l'industrie chimique en Europe. Ça, il faut l'avoir en tête. Despite its obligation as the executive body of the EU, the European Commission has until now failed in implementing the measures MEPs and member states have called for. Sweden have been the first country to bring this issue to the European Court of Justice, which recognised the breach of law by the European Commission. I have to call upon the European Commission, the guardian of the Treaty for the European Union, to respect a ruling of the European Court of Justice and to comply with it. The Court's ruling that was crystal clear to say that there was no impact assessment to social economic uh, consequences was necessary before the independent scientific criteria would be set. European Union citizens are losing trust in the European Union. So the last we can use is a European Commission that is not even complying with court's rulings. Thank you. It is true that the Commission failed its legal obligations to deliver uh, on time. It is our job as policy makers to protect the European Union citizens from the impact of such substances when they have adverse effects. My proposal today is to follow the widely agreed WHO definition of an endocrine disruptor which states that a substance that has an endocrine mode of action which consequently causes an adverse effect. It is true that this definition has been defined some time ago. However, I would like to point out that it has not been easy to agree on how to legislate and make the criteria operational in our approval process. Substances identified as endocrine disruptors are banned unless very strict derogations apply. Not every lobbying story ends that way. Take bees, for example. Bee populations in Europe have been in sharp decline, posing a real problem for our ecosystems and ultimately the food on our plates. 
so protecting these pollinators is essential. In 2012, British and French researchers published evidence suggesting pesticides called neonicotinoids were linked to the decline of bee colonies. The European Commission proposed a partial and temporary ban. Sure enough, two of the companies producing neonicotinoids waged an all-out lobbying war against the ban. They sent menacing letters to the EU Food Safety Authority, scaremongered about losses to agriculture and produced biased studies. Another pesticide company, BASF, used a front group called Bees Biodiversity Network to greenwash its activities. The network, for example, co-organised an exhibition at the European Parliament, playing down the harmful role of pesticides and stressing other causes for the bees' decline. But in this particular case, the public was informed and engaged and under pressure of public opinion, politicians were finally forced to stand up to big industry. The European Commission went ahead with its proposal and a clear majority of EU countries supported it. Three of Bayer and Syngenta's pesticides, which had been linked to the decline in bees, were banned, at least temporarily. With federal toxic law broken and no improved law likely coming soon, action on chemical safety on the state level has taken the spotlight. In 2013, 29 states introduced policies to reduce exposure to toxic chemicals in legislative sessions. And so it is that big business interests capture the policy agenda, ensuring that European laws time and time again serve the interests of large corporations above those of the people of Europe. That is, unless those people speak out. Breast Cancer UK is taking a stand on the high levels of these dangerous chemicals in our environment. Currently, we are leading a focused campaign against a pervasive EDC called bisphenol A, which is found in many plastics. Due to the cancer risk, Canada has already classified bisphenol A as a toxin, and, along with the US, they are drawing up new laws to phase it out of babies' products. But the UK government has not acknowledged these dangers, as they argue that there is not yet enough conclusive evidence on how bisphenol A affects people. This may appear reasonable, but scientists have so far been unable to carry out a conclusive human trial. With no time for delay, we need to consult the evidence that is available. There have been many persuasive studies on laboratory rats and mice. They consistently demonstrated that exposure to bisphenol A in the womb and around the time of birth leads to alterations in mammary tissue, which can go on to develop into tumours. Importantly, the subjects were given environmentally relevant amounts of bisphenol A, low concentrations of the chemical, just as any person would encounter in everyday life. Studies have also been carried out on cultures of human breast cancer cells. They demonstrated that bisphenol A can activate estrogen receptors and encourage the multiplication of cancer cells. Further studies have shown that exposure to bisphenol A is also very common. The chemical is present in plastic food containers, food can linings and babies' products and it has been proven that bisphenol A can leach into what we all eat and drink. 38 of the world's leading scientific experts on bisphenol A have considered all this evidence and warned policymakers about the potentially harmful effects of exposure to the chemical. The evidence shows us that something has to be done. The Japanese are cutting back in their use of bisphenol A and recent independent studies have motivated the FDA to take a fresh look.
It's not so much you are what you eat, it's that you are what your mother ate, and maybe you are what your grandmother ate. And if you take our data, you are what stress your grandmother or grandfather had. It takes a lot of resources, a lot of attention, and a lot of awareness uh, of the problems for people to make a difference. This is really a social and political problem, and we need, if, if any chemical is toxic and known to accumulate in umbilical cord, blood, or mother's milk, it really has no place in our economy. As consumers become more aware of the need for safer materials, companies that offer non-toxic products are benefiting financially. Safer materials are helping to enhance the bottom line in sectors as diverse as clothing, food, and cosmetics. In the U.S., some companies are following the lead of Europe and eliminating chemicals banned in the EU from products sold in the U.S., even though they're not required to do so under U.S. law. In fact, hundreds of companies have signed the Compact for Safe Cosmetics to provide at least the same protection in the U.S. as in Europe. And then, there are some promising new developments in laboratories. Green chemistry. Why not come up with alternatives to mercury? Why not come up with alternatives to the hazards? To design at the molecular level, just as an architect designs a building, we can design molecules to do what we want them to do. We don't have to have toxic materials. Green chemistry is the science of how to make materials that society depends on in an environmentally responsible way. That's basically what it is, is how do you make a molecule and have that molecule do all the things you want it to do and not hurt the environment. I would say, quite frankly, we should be more worried about these health effects. They are going to be more imminent in terms of human society and humankind and all living organisms on Earth than the threat of climate change. It's going to get us sooner. Every generation before our, our generation was not living as long as we are living and not as healthy as us. And now what we are seeing is the younger generation with tremendously higher incidence of cancer, of obesity, of diabetes, of neurologic disorders of brain and behavioral abnormalities, of immune disorders, all of these are caused by environmental endocrine disruptors. And the incidence of all of these diseases in our children are much higher than in my generation. Well. With what I know today about the extensive misuse of chemistry on a global scale, I cannot conjure up good dreams for the future. I have only bad dreams. Yet I want the world to be cleaner and to be kinder to each child that is born. I often wonder what makes me keep digging. I'm going to cry. <laughs> But I also realize that in the process of dehumanizing mankind with man-made chemicals, we are also producing individuals who will never understand the need to protect what is natural, to protect our life support systems. Individuals who will never see the beauty and the mystery in the birth of a new baby or the bursting forth of foliage in a food crop in the springtime. Despite these dire thoughts, more and more, though, I see parents who are concerned about their health and the health of their children. And women, especially, are trying desperately to find out what is safe and what will not harm the babies they are carrying in their wombs and their children already there in their homes. There is also hope that deep within everyone, there is something bigger and stronger than we are aware of at this time that cannot be suppressed by man-made chemicals something that will prompt some very exceptional leadership to step forward with the courage to turn off corporate control of the government and the world and take back for society what it needs to thrive.